and welcome to this very first Europa Saal plenary session. Today we're taking a look at drivers for a just and social energy transition. Now, when addressing the climate crisis, it's important to design measures in a manner that is inclusive and socially equitable. The main question that I'll be looking at with my panelists today is, what are the steps necessary to ensure that the shift towards a low carbon energy world is organized in a socially inclusive and just manner? I'd like to now introduce the guests on the panel, starting on the left of your screen. Pavi Shabazov is the Minister of Energy for Azerbaijan. He was appointed as Azerbaijan's Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary to the Federal Republic of Germany in 2005, a position you held until 2016. Welcome, thanks so much for joining us today. Leonor Gewessler, the Federal Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology of Austria. She's also a scientist and an environmental activist. She was previously the Executive Director of the environmental organization Global 2000 from 2014 to 2019. Welcome, Your Excellency. Kostas Grekas, the Minister of the Environment and Energy for Greece, and you have been a member of the Greek Parliament with the New Democracy Party since 2012. Welcome, thank you so much. And Konstantin Borosan, he is the State Secretary for Energy in the Ministry of Infrastructure and Regional Development of Moldova, and you've worked on a number of projects aimed at modernizing the Moldovan energy sector. Thank you so much for being with me live and joining us virtually. First, we have Lucia Bakulumpaji Wamala. She's the CEO and founder of Bakulu Power, which is a renewable energy company that designs installs and operates energy systems for both residential and commercial clients in Uganda. Hello, welcome, Lucia. And Barbara Pompili, Hi. Minister of the Ecological Transition for France, a post that you've held since 2020. She was also previously Secretary of State for Biodiversity. Welcome. Thank you all so much for joining me today. I know that our time is limited, and so I'm going to get right into our questions. The first, uh, for this first round of questions, I'll ask you all to keep your responses to about two minutes. And the first question is for our ministers on the panel. Minister Gewessler, Minister, so Minister Pompili, and Minister Skrekas. You each represent um, a European Union member state. Can you speak to a bit about how your respective countries work within the European framework to ensure that the transition to an economy with net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 will be achieved while advancing the socio-economic well-being of all citizens. And I'd like to start with Minister Gewessler of Austria. Thanks a lot. Uh, what an honor to give the first input. I'll start it on a, um, um, on a quite meta level. I think within the European Union, and it's also reflected in the question that you pose, one point that makes us strong together in this transition is that we actually talk about the transition. It's no longer about incremental changes here and there, but we really talk about a step change in ambition and in implementation to in the energy transition. The second point is we do it on a, on a set of, um, of a, on a common denominator, that we want to do it in a transparent and open and accountable way, in a socially just way, in an inclusive way. And this enables, I think, us all to inject these pockets of disruptive change also into the systems that we need to, to achieve in order to, to advance really towards um, a, a new way of producing, consuming uh, energy based on renewables. And so I think with these two factors, the, the, basic, the, the basic anchor in terms of the Green Deal, in terms of transition and the way we do things, this really enables us to create a virtual spiral to, um, to not only focus on the lowest common denominator. I think that's really one of the, the, the key things um, to take away from, from or that I take away now from my two years of experience in the council as a minister. Briefly, three examples how this how we try to implement this. I'll be very brief, I know, <laughs> on how we implement this in Austria. Uh, the one thing is uh, energy transition. We focus a lot on, on uh, energy communities. So we get a framework from the European Union. We stretched it to the max in Austria to implement it really in a very open and transparent way because it um, brings new actors in the system. It allows for participation uh, in the energy transition for citizens. We focus in policy design on, on social justice, for example, by enabling 100% funding for low-income households in uh, changing their heating systems. 
and um, the carbon pricing that we now uh, introduce as of July this year, all of the income is channeled back to consumers on a per capita bonus, the climate bonus, that works especially towards uh, low income households because they consume less CO2. So it's about the way we do things, about the goal we have, but also about the policy design that we use uh, at the European level and at the national level. And I think this enables us to go further. And if the current situation teaches us one thing, then that's exactly what we need to do. We need to ad advance our ambition and be even more coherent and fast in the implementation of the energy transition. Absolutely. And I'm glad that we took the time. Those are three fantastic measures. I'll ask now Minister Skrekas of Greece. Uh, well, I think yeah, it's on. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Now it's okay. So, uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Let me say that uh, the question describes exactly uh, the task that uh, all European governments uh, uh, have undertaken regarding the, uh, the, uh, the European uh, common vision, which is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And, uh, of course, this is not uh, an easy task uh, at all. Uh, I mean, on one hand, to, to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and on the other hand, uh, to uh, make sure that nobody will be left behind, uh, uh, nobody will be excluded. Uh, and why I say this? Because uh, uh, there must be huge investments, uh, huge investments in uh, renewable uh, sources, uh, large investments in the upgrading of the electricity grids, uh, in building uh, storage systems so that to penetrate, uh, to increase the penetration of renewables uh, into our energy mix. So uh, all this uh, cost must be recovered. All these uh, investments should be recovered. So, uh, who is going to pay in the medium term in the transition period, mm -hmm. transitional period? Of course, the consumer. So we have to make sure that uh, during this period, uh, the most uh, vulnerable are not, are not going to be excluded. Uh, that is why right currently Europe provide, provides all elements in order to really achieve a just transition. So provides the financing tools. Uh, the financial tools, uh, for example, uh, Resilience and Recovery Fund, uh, we, we utilize more than 5 billion euro from that, uh, from the Resilience Fund in Greece in order to, uh, to promote energy efficiency in, the, in households uh, and uh, uh, in uh, businesses, uh, also to, to uh, subsidize, to support the, 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 the construction and the building, the establishment of uh, storage facilities by uh, subsidizing the capex so the recovery of the cost will be lower to the consumer's file. Uh, also, Europe, uh, apart from the financial tools, provides also the regulation, a very clear uh, and very open and transparent, uh, transparent regulation, very well designed, uh, in order to, to uh, achieve this, um, uh, this uh, uh, transition with the best cost-effective uh, way, which is uh, very important. Uh, so, in Greece, of course, we fully share and we promote uh, the common European vision of uh, achieving ca yeah, the carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, we are expanding the interconnections with the neighboring countries. Uh, we are uh, promoting uh, uh, co energy communities, especially in order to uh, reduce the cost to the most uh, vulnerable households, but also to support uh, some specific sectors of the economy, like the primary sector, agriculture, and uh, the secondary section. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister Pompili of France, I'd like to ask you the same question and remind all of our panelists who will still be speaking, we have a lot to get through. It's the same story as always. We don't have enough time. Please limit your responses to two minutes. Minister Pompili. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me today. I'm very pleased to be with you. And uh, this is crucial for us, and I totally agree with, with uh, what uh, Costa said. Uh, working within the European framework gives us the best chance to achieve this goal. The EU has pledged to reduce its carbon emission by uh, 50, 55 by 2030 and to reach carbon neutrality by 2030, 2050. These targets are extremely ambitious and will require bold measures. And as president of the European Environment and Energy Councils, I'm determined to push the negotiation forward and find common ground on the Fit for 55 package by the end of the French presidency. And this ambitious legislative package paves the way to 2030 and organizes the decarbonization of the key sector and the, uh, of the economy. And there are many reasons why the EU Green Deal is the best framework to reach these goals. Mm -hmm. First, efficiency. 
The EU is a leading continent for carbon pricing. And thanks to the strength of the European carbon market, the emissions of the industry and power production sectors have been reduced significantly since 2005. With the Fit for 55 package, the ETS will be strengthened and extended to new sectors. And the Council has also agreed on the creation of a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which will incentivize our trade partners to align their climate policies with the EU. Second, level playing field across member states. The energy transition will require huge additional investment by 2030 to spur economic activity and innovation. And for instance, the EU is leading the transition towards electric vehicles thanks to ambitious policies such as the CO2 emission standards on car. And third and last, um, in line uh, with uh, what uh, uh, Eleanor and Costa said, uh, social justice and solidarity. The EU is the most advanced form of international cooperation to provide solidarity across member states, workers and taxpayers. For instance, the Just Transition Fund targets the regions which are the most affected and helps workers and businesses to reallocate their resources toward most sustainable activities. It's very important, I repeat, not to leave uh, anyone behind. Absolutely. Thank you. We don't want to leave anyone behind. Welcome back. We're going to turn to a guest now joining us live, Minister Shabazov of Azerbaijan. Now, Azerbaijan has significant untapped renewable energy potential, but your country's energy economy is still geared heavily towards the domestic consumption and the export of fossil fuels. What is your government's master plan for reducing Azerbaijan's dependency on oil and gas at minimal cost to those, as we were talking about earlier, the most vulnerable who might need this industry? First of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I have to um, mention that, um, you know, Azerbaijan, for the historical reasons, has been the hydrocarbon-rich country. Uh, another important element was that Azerbaijan uh, has been striving also to provide for, each, for, for, for its own energy security and sustainability uh, of the energy sector. Uh, that's why uh, the oil and gas sector has been uh, developing very uh, effectively and rapidly in the recent years and we were providing for the energy security not only for uh, Azerbaijan but also for its neighbors and its partners and also made significant contribution into the energy security of uh, Europe. At the same time, uh, we have to understand that uh, without provided energy security, we cannot uh, start the processes of decarbonization. And now when we have already uh, provided for the necessary level of the energy security uh, at the national level, we have started to embark on the development of the renewable sources uh, of energy in Azerbaijan, and it has, be it has become already one of the priorities of the social economic development in our country. And of course, we see the development of renewable sources of energy as one of the uh, important uh, elements for the economic development in our country. Uh, at the same time, I uh, uh, have to uh, mention uh, that uh, we um, have uh, the great plans uh, for the development uh, of the renewable source of energy on the liberated uh, uh, the territories of Azerbaijan. And we, um, uh, in a parallel, have declared uh, the 30% of the uh, share in the generation capacities uh, of our country for the renewable sources of energy by 2030. And uh, we have uh, enormous uh, uh, the capacities the, of the renewable sources of energy and uh, concretely the wind energy in the Azerbaijani uh, sector of the Caspian Sea, which 
actually uh, is coming to the focus of our government and we would like to embark on the development of this and uh, I'd sphere. And I'd love to come back to this a little bit later for another question that I'll be asking Thank of you. you. Thank you so much, Minister Shabazov. Secretary Borosan, the Moldovan government has made it a priority to help the country's most vulnerable cope with high energy prices. What measures have you taken so far when it comes to this and what role does international cooperation play? Thank you. Thank you, first of all, for for inviting us and to have opportunity to participate in such inspiring event. Moldova, for the first time, participate in this uh, Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue. And please accept, um, apologize from His Excellency, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister Andrei Spino, for not being able to participate at, at this event from objective reasons. Back to, to your question. Uh, indeed, Moldova has taken uh, list of actions to support consumers fa facing, uh, uh, facing uh, uh, prices spikes in, in la last uh, months we, we, we saw. And immediately when uh, government was appointed, was taken measures to increase the minimum amount of pensions to, to more than 10% uh, of population who, which benefits from, from that social protection. Then government has taken a decision to increase the, the, uh, the minimum wage in the real sector. This also contributed to increase incomes of population, of consumers to pay their bills. Uh, then of course more uh, targeted measures were taken when, uh, when uh, uh, tariffs were, were increased and this is support directly into bill uh, and we, we discuss here about consumers which, uh, which have a consumption until a certain level uh, of energy, for instance in case of gas, so consumers which, um, which consume not uh, more than 150 cubic meters of gas benefit from a compensation uh, which government uh, cover. And also those consumers connected to district heating also benefit from uh, uh, compensation directly in, into the bill. Uh, this is uh, one of the measures what government taken. Another... I'd love to come back to this actually later. We, I want to make sure we have time for all of our guests to, um, to, to introduce themselves. I'd now like to turn to our next digital guest, um, Ms. Bakulu... Uh, Bakulum Paji Wamala, I'd like to let my, um, uh, I'd like to let Kara know I'm having an issue with my iPad right now. Um, but I'd like now to turn to Ms. Bakulum Paji Wamala, who can give her opening statement. Absolutely. Are you okay? Yes. Um, I'm, go, please go ahead. Yeah, sure. Is there a question directed towards me or should I just speak? No, definitely there's a question directed towards you. Unfortunately, the, okay. the power on my iPad has just gone out and I'm going to ask Kara to join me up on stage for a moment and I'll be able to direct okay. a question at you. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs> Thanks so no, much, Kara. No worries. Thank you so much. All right, we're there. Now, based on your experience in your native Uganda, how did you go about informing local communities of the opportunities that were associated with the energy projects that you were implementing, and how were your ideas met? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first, I also want to thank, uh, thank you for inviting me. It's really um, very humbling to be on a stage, well, virtually, <laughs> with all of these D ministers. Um, so for us at Bakulu Power, we really, we just follow the regulatory framework set forth by the government. So the first step when you're, when you're introducing an energy project is to go to the community. So we have um, a hierarchy of local leaders. We liaise mostly with the sub-county chief and the chief administrative officer. So absolutely step one was getting in touch with them and letting them know our intentions to come and electrify their communities. And we held um, public com open community uh, meetings and we let everybody have a chance to, you know, get on the microphone and speak. And we were met with, we were met very positively. Um, one thing that came up, which kind of shocked me at first during our, one of our earlier meetings, was a local resident immediately said, well, don't come here and steal all of our women. And I 
I found it a very odd um, <laughs> comment. But the further I got in the development process, I actually began to understand what he was saying. When you have people, I mean, I'm Ugandan, yes, but you can hear my accent. I was raised in the West. So when you have people coming from abroad and um, even our low, our team is really, everyone is, except for me, is born and bred in Uganda. But even still, when you come from the city of Kampala and you're working in a deep rural area, there is a disparity between income. So you have sometimes in these um, deep rural community projects, sometimes people do get taken advantage of. So it does actually cause marital issues sometimes when there's, you know, the better off <laughs> men from the city coming and working in deep rural communities. So that was one, one comment that really stood out to me. And it just showed the importance of mm -hmm. really working with the yep. community to let them know that we're not here to come and take over anything. We're here to work together. Great. Thank you so much. I'd like to now uh, come to our second round of questions and to my panelists. Again, I'd like to ask you to keep your answers to the limited time amount because I want to make sure we all have a chance to hear the vitally important things you have to say. And I'll start round two with Minister Skrekas. Your government put a strong emphasis on maintaining the economic competitiveness of regions affected by the push towards delignification of Greece's energy sector. Can you name me one or two of the best practices that have emerged from this initiative? First, uh, let me say that uh, in uh, September 2018, our Prime Minister announced from the United Nations Conference in New York that we're going to phase out all, all our lignite power plants by 2028. And that was a very wise decision, uh, taking account that uh, not uh, only the consequences of uh, the use of lignite and coal uh, in, in, uh, in, in the environment, but also the financial implications. Uh, especially if you add the carbon tax that we have initiated here in, in Europe in order to uh, reduce uh, uh, gas emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and thus uh, protect uh, our planet and, and the environment for the next generation. So um, what uh, should be done by, uh, I say economic implications as well, because in order to maintain the, the operation of the currently uh, operating uh, lignite power plants in Greece, uh, the public power corporation should uh, invest a huge amount of money, uh, hundreds of millions, maybe billions, uh, in uh, modernizing them, in, in uh, uh, reconstructing them, uh, so to be able to uh, maintain them in operation and at the same time meeting the environmental uh, uh, terms. Uh, so why someone to invest um, uh, billions of euro in, in lignite and, and not in uh, renewables uh, where, uh, where you can uh, produce uh, energy, electricity, uh, three times cheaper, even five times cheaper if, if you add the uh, carbon tax. Uh, so, uh, of course, this has some consequences. On it the does, local, I want to come to those consequences in a little bit. I want to make sure that we get to all of our panelists. Thank you. Minister Secretary Borasan, uh, the contracts governing Moldovan energy supply have been heavily influenced by regional geopolitics. That this has made the national energy system particularly susceptible to supply shortages when diplomatic tensions flare up. How does government plan to resolve these dependency issues, which put the population at risk of power and heat outages? Well, indeed, uh, regional, regional situation affects uh, energy supply, gas supplies to Moldova and to, to countries in the region, but I would like to stress that the government of Moldova already take, taken some actions to strengthen our uh, energy security, and that's we already uh, approved new draft uh, law on natural gas which impose obligations of suppliers to have minimum amounts of gas stored in the, into the storages. That's uh, one of the measures what we expect will uh, attenuate uh, other next possible crises. Also, we are working on uh, uh, diversification of sources and routes of supply of electricity and uh, last uh, evolutions in this regard. And, and I mentioned here synchronization of our power system and Ukraine power system with continental, continental Europe will significantly contribute to strengthen our uh, uh, stability of power system to work, to, to work stable and to have access to other sources 
of uh, electricity. These sound like some good first steps, and I'm excited to see what happens with Moldova in the future. I'd like to turn now to Ms. Bakulumpaji Wamala. Now, your company, Bakulu Power, does a lot to provide underserved communities with access to power, particularly through the deployment of mini-grids. I wonder if you can tell us a few of the benefits about this decentralized approach when it comes to the energy transition, especially in that social context. And you spoke about it, but this before, but I think this is a really important to talk about. Absolutely. Uh, well, decentralized plays a really important role. I think a lot of times when people think of power projects, they think of Grand Renaissance Dam, Grand Inga Dam. Of course, my iPad would fall as I'm talking. Um, <laughs> think of Grand Renaissance or Grand Inga. But the smaller projects like ours, mini grids, can actually get people electrified, get, can get communities electrified a lot faster. Of course, the sources of power are not as huge, but when you're dealing with communities that have never had electricity, they may not necessarily need such a robust um, generation to begin with. And also a big benefit of decentralized is that um, you can, if, if the grid does get extended eventually, you can just kind of add them in, you know, you can feed in these mini grids into the big um, national grid. So I think the biggest benefit is, um, is the speed. That's a great benefit. Um, I'm happy to see that we're having problems with iPads, both live and <laughs> online. It's fantastic. I appreciate the solidarity. <laughs> We're going to go ahead and stay with one of our virtual visitors. I'd like to turn now to Minister Pompili. Now, how has your government motivated the French citizens to become an active part of your country's ecological transition? Do you have one strategy that succeeded maybe, and maybe one area that's pr proved to be more of a hard sell? Minister Pompili? Yes, uh, achieving France climate and energy objectives depends on a diverse and complementary mix of public policies. The daily commitment of each citizen is necessary. And by favoring climate-friendly lifestyles and consumption patterns, citizens become key players in the low-carbon transition. They influence the economy as a whole. Because the fight against climate change will have concrete impacts on uh, our citizens, we organized a public consultation on our new climate and energy roadmap using a dedicated web platform. The purpose is to feed into this roadmap by notifying the policies levers favored by the public. Another example of large-scale involvement of citizens is the French Citizens' Convention on Climate, a national debate in December 2018 had shown a strong demand for more participatory democracy and a just transition. So the President Macron decided to organize an unprecedented initiative to include citizens in a participative democratic exercise on climate. The French Citizens' Convention on Climate was asked to propose measures to achieve the current climate target in a spirit of social justice, and uh, 150 citizens were chosen randomly and worked for nine months uh, with dozens of experts to propose concrete measures. And in the end, the members of the convention adopted uh, 149 measures covering all sectors, mobility, conception, housing, production, and food, the French Climate and Resilience Law, voted uh, last year in Parliament, is directly inspired from the citizens' proposals. And its ambition is to spur a major change in society. And for instance, we have introduced new obligations in, st in terms of thermal renovation of buildings and created renovation coaches that will help households in the planning and design of their renovation project. We are pushing environmental labeling further to reflect the climate impacts of good and we have banned internal flights when there is an alternative by rail in less than two hours and a an half. And last, we are making vegetarian options available in public and university canteens, so on and so forth. Uh, as you see, it's a full range of measures that will imply also a revolution in the citizens' behavior. Definitely a full range, but it sounds like the people are 
starting to enjoy them. That's fantastic. Bringing it back to our hall, I'd like to come to Minister Shabazov again. How do you see the buildup of Azerbaijan's sustainable energy se sector contributing to employment creation and economic recovery? We're obviously still in a pandemic, but I'd like you to speak to about it briefly for about two minutes post-COVID. Uh, you know, the stability in the Azerbaijani energy sector has been achieved uh, by the means of uh, diversity of sources, uh, routes, and markets. And we also uh, wish to uh, continue this policy of uh, resilience, this strategy also in the future. And to this end, we are working very hard on the application and development of the renewable sources of energy. And we believe that the development of the renewable energy sector in Azerbaijan will uh, contribute, as I have already mentioned uh, in my previous comments, uh, to the social welfare, economic development, and also environmental uh, sustainability. And uh, what we also uh, do in Azerbaijan, last year we have adopt, we, we adopted two laws. One f about uh, the application of renewable sources of energy, another one on energy efficiency. And as a result, we've been able to attract uh, private sector uh, to the very large uh, renewable uh, uh, the energy projects for solar and wind parks in Azerbaijan. And this process is going on. So we don't want to burden the, uh, the, the, the country's budget for these purposes, rather than uh, attract the private sector. And we have been successful and we will continue this way, uh, hoping that it will contribute into the further economic and social development of our country and of course will positively influence uh, the uh, employment uh, opportunities. Thank you very much, Minister Shabazov. Minister Gewessler, now Austria is a technological leader when it comes to some very carbon intensive industries such as paper uh, and metal production. How does Austria plan to use its technological edge to make those hard to abate sectors carbon neutral by 24 as is Austria's stated goal? Indeed. Um, we want to be uh, climate neutral by 2040 and that of course is a challenge. I think Kostas mentioned it earlier for many of us in many sectors, but especially if you look at uh, the hard to abate sectors in industry. So this needs a special focus. Um, but I'm 100% convinced this is not only a challenge, but it's a huge chance. It's a huge chance for innovation, for employment, for, uh, for also technological leadership in many sectors. And Austria has done it before. If you look at steel production, decades ago, uh, Austria developed, an Austrian company developed a new process, um, the linz donowitz verfahren It's still used for the majority of steel production worldwide. So... That's the task we have to do again, to do it in a climate neutral way. So how do we, how do we go about that? Um, I think it needs the right framework conditions, also legal, uh, in, in law that, uh, that we are here as politicians responsible for. So I see our Renewables Deployment Act, 100% renewable electricity by 2030, as one step of that equation. Because the stable, um, stable and price competitive electricity supply is at the base, because m much of this will be about electrification, green hydrogen, so that's, that's a basic uh, assumption. The second one is, of course, this needs extensive investments. And this needs extensive investments in a, in a, a competitive environment that's also there globally. So this also needs support. We were talking about a just transition with a view to individual households earlier. We also need to look at it with the view of who are the, the, the sectors that have the biggest challenges in, in the industry that need special support. Because for most of them, this means really a disruption in business models, completely new business models or product portfolios. It needs new production processes, long investment cycles. So also in, in politics, we have to step up to that, uh, to that challenge and develop our support mechanisms accordingly. 
So that's why we use RRF, the European Recovery Fund money for a transformation of industry fund. That's why in our new climate law, we have a, uh, embedded a transformation fund with a longer term perspective, um, also in, in support mechanisms for industry outside of the ETS. And that's also why we build another uh, mechanism for the ETS uh, side of industry, because we just need to acknowledge that this technological step change that we that we have there will need public support. But uh, if, if this comes together, the good legal framework at European level, we do this with the carbon border adjustment at the national level, with the, uh, the energy reg regulation and the support mechanisms, I think this is exactly the end, the third factor. Let's not forget the companies who have uh, CEOs who now understand this is the time to do this leap into a climate neutrality production process. Then I think we really have all the ingredients there to to actually make use of this of this position and and um, because this will be the demand of the future. The Absolutely, demand of the future, and I'm green products, green production processes. And I love that you brought in their public support because that's the next question I have that I'd like to address to all of you. It's about public support and because engaging communities from the bottom up, it's critical to this big job that we have in front of us um, and realizing the full potential of renewable energy sources. Um, we have about seven minutes for this, which means each of you gets about a minute. So I want to ask you for one mean or method, what way have you, have you come up with or made use of that you found to be particularly effective to establish inclusive and just participation and supply chain process? Minister Costas? Let me first say Great. that uh, right now, currently in Greece, uh, uh, they operate more than 700 uh, energy communities with a capacity in renewables of uh, more than one, uh, more than half a gigawatt. Uh, we also are going to utilize more than 100 million euro from the Resilience uh, and Recovery Fund in order to promote and support uh, energy communities uh, that uh, will be uh, granted 100% of the cost of the renewables in order to subsidize and limit, reduce the energy cost uh, they, uh, they, they pay. So we're talking about vulnerable households. And this is a way also to mitigate and tackle the consequences of the lignitization process in uh, uh, Western Macedonia that is currently taking uh, part in Greece. Thank you very much. I'd like to go to one of our virtual attendees, Minister Pompili. Can you tell us one method that you, uh, France, has come up with that is especially effective? Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the French government has taken several measures to help local authorities to develop renewable energy projects. For instance, in partnership with our ecological transition agency called ADEM, we have launched a network of councillors that will help local authorities to better plan the deployment of renewable in their territory by providing information on renewable technologies and guidelines to enhance local acceptance, like planification, local consultation, etc. We want to help communities to be actors of the energy transition by developing self-conception projects which can benefit from a specific support scheme. We are also working on creating a regulatory framework for energy communities that will allow the members to produce share and sell their energy. And last November, I announced 10 measures to accelerate the development of participatory projects by local stakeholders. In particular, I set a national target of 1,000 new projects by 2028. And finally, the French government is currently consulting on the revision of its energy and climate roadmap. This discussion will help define national and regional goals that will be shared by all the interest parties. Thank you very much, Minister Pompili. I'd like to go back to Minister Gewessler. I can uh, really uh, continue where Barbara left off. Energy communities is a is a big issue for us. I mentioned it in the very beginning, uh, as Costas also described, so I will not go into this a lot. I'd like to bring in another thought. Um, it's uh, the question of um, what does just transition mean and this leap towards the energy transition for the labor market and uh, for for the people actually working in sectors that will now face big changes. 
And so what, what we did in Austria is we started a just transition process together with the Chamber of Labour, the tra trade unions, but also the Employers Association and looked really very intensively at the sectors that are carbon intensive and labour intensive to see um, not only where do we need additional qualifications, because if we want to have 1 million PV installations on our Austrian roofs by 2030, I need people to actually put them up. So where do we need additional qualifications? How do we train workforce? Where do we get the people? But also to look at the sectors that really face change, because there's people in there with their personal histories who, who are proud about what they do. And then we say, but now things have to change. So what do we need to accompany this change also in the in the labor market and uh, and in in um, with all the structural and regional aspects all of this has? And so that's why we brought together all the actors. We'll present the first action plan for the energy and the and uh, so the, the the heating and electricity sector in the first quarter of this year. And then we come up with a set of measures what we have to do in order to make sure that. Um, I think taking people along is 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 not the the right framing for what actually the task is, but for really making people actors in this transition and empower them to be part of this transition. Absolutely, they are a part of this transition. Uh, Minister Shabazov. Uh, yes, um, we also uh, working on the development, the different forms and ways of uh, the support mechanisms for uh, the active consumers of the electricity energy. And at the same time, uh, we, on the liberated uh, territories of Azerbaijan, uh, we are now in a process of building uh, some uh, smart villages, which uh, will be then uh, uh, fully uh, regulated uh, and managed uh, by the local authorities, municipalities, energy communities, and also due to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the green energy concept for the whole Karabakh region, we uh, are going to install on every house uh, the uh, solar panel or solar uh, collectors uh, to provide uh, these households with the renewable sources of energy. So they are the different mechanisms that we are working on that and in most cases we try to attract also private sectors to these processes. Cooperation between the public and the private sector is absolutely going to be vital to make the energy transition happen. Uh, we'll go to our virtual guest again, uh, Lucia Bakulumpaji Wamala. Um, yeah, as project developers, working with the community is, as I mentioned earlier, it's our first step. You know, uh, modeling energy projects is very difficult. You want to, I mean, especially when you're a for-profit company, you have to model per very, very, very close to reality. <laughs> so when we work in deep rural communities, there are no benchmarks. These are communities that are not electrified at all. So one example of something we've done is, you know, during our socioeconomic study, we hired trusted community members to knock on doors with us to um, try and gather data for our modeling. So trusted community members such as teachers and nurses, because you can have the best intentions, but you can't force someone to use the electricity you want to bring, and you have to earn their trust. And for us, you know, I think a lot of times when we talk about energy, we forget that these are people, these are people's lives. People want jobs, people want dignity. So we cannot skip over working um, with the communities, much like we cannot skip over working with the regulators. We also work very closely with regulators in Uganda um, because we want projects that will be built, that will be used. A lot of times the modeling is wrong and projects, you know, developers go bankrupt. So the community is who we're really doing everything for, and we even have a profit-sharing agreement as part of our business model. I'm more, ha more than happy to go on and on at another time uh, with just some on-the-ground real-life experience. That would be fantastic. I don't think that we have the time, unfortunately, in today's panel because I want to make sure <laughs> to hear from Moldova. Secretary Borosan. Yes, I... Concerning um, citizens and energy community, energy communities as a form of business still for Moldova, this is to be transposed into national legislation at, uh, since it came from, from clean energy package, but 
uh, ho however, uh, um, um, instrument which encouraging small scale projects in, in, in national legislation, this, uh, this is net metering mechanism and we see high demand for such, uh, for such uh, support mechanisms from residential sector, especially since this offers uh, flexibility for consumers to use electricity and um, electrify or heat uh, their homes with electricity. And, um, and, and uh, when we discuss about uh, just transition, I think that we need to go into definition of, of this, of this uh, uh, term. And this is especially uh, right for emerging, emerging econom economies. And I think that we need to consider access to technologies and uh, uh, access to affordable or flexible uh, financing mechanism to allow uh, bottom-up approach and increasing uh, renewable energy uh, expansion from the, from the uh, root, let's say, in this way. Absolutely, and I have to say what a pleasure it also is to see our panelists here in the hall nodding along with you. It's really an absolute pleasure. I have to say it has been, um, it's been a, a great honor of mine to be able to speak with you all today. I'm sure you are looking at your clocks as well. Our time is going to be wrapping up, but I do want to make sure that we take the time for each of you to give a final statement. I'll have to ask you to leave about a minute for each of your final statements. And we'll go back to Luisa, sorry, Lucia Bakulumpaji Wamala for her final statements. Um, my final statement would be really short and quick. I'm more than happy to keep discussing things on social media. You can reach me at, at Lucia Wamala on Instagram, on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. Um, just reach out. I think that's fantastic. Definitely reach out. This is what this is all about. <laughs> it's about dialogue. It's speaking with one another. I'm happy that you're letting people know that they can talk to you. I'll come back to you for a final statement, Secretary Borosan. I'll say that Moldova has uh, expressed his uh, its high ambition in uh, uh, national determined contributions submitted uh, uh, being the fourth country which submitted uh, its revised ambition and uh, now uh, as as uh, the main word of this word of this uh, event is time for uh, from ambition to action. So we will, we need to move in this direction. Absolutely, we do need to move in this direction. Um, I'm going to move in this direction to Minister Skrekas. Let me say that uh, currently Europe is leading the world regarding the uh, carbon uh, neutrality. Uh, we are all part of this. We fully share this European vision, this ambitious uh, vision. Of course, there are uh, extreme conditions and situations currently that we have to tackle. So uh, Europe uh, and all together we should act now in order to protect this vision and uh, of course to, to support the most vulnerable that uh, are facing currently quite severe situations uh, regarding the price spikes and, and the way they, they should carry. So in order for this to be implemented in time, maybe even sooner now, because now it seems uh, it, it is uh, proven to be uh, so critical because it's not only uh, the uh, the delinked, uh, the delinked, let's say, the, to be delinked from the Russian gas. It is uh, it is uh, to uh, regain our energy dependency as Europe. Uh, so altogether, both uh, energy security and uh, energy transition to carbon neutrality, uh, I think, show the way. And for that, we should act uh, as a unity and act uh, quickly. Absolutely, acting together and acting quickly. Very important parts. Uh, Minister Gewessler, your final comments. Again, I can immediately pick up um, from um, where my colleague left off because it is exceptional times. And it's not the first gas crisis uh, that we live it's an exceptional because it's exceptional because it's now based on an actual war on European territory, which um, which really um, I think everybody shares the, the concern and the uh, in this. But 
it means that the energy transition is not any longer only about, um, well, it never was, but maybe <laughs> it's not only about climate action, yeah? But I think it has become blatantly clear that this is also about uh, security policy, that this is about independence, that this is about so much more. Uh, it's probably also about democracy. And so um, that we really need to, speed, th this needs to be the lesson out of this situation, that we really need to speed up uh, implementation of the energy transition. Every windmill that we put up this year is a sign for independence, is a step towards independence. Every fossil heating system that we change this year is a path in the, is a step in the right direction. And I think this must be the, the, the lesson. Let's not postpone, but let's advance um, um, this common effort. And let's do it together, obviously. Learn from each other. Thanks for this event. Exactly. Thank you so much. And it's true. This is something that we're all going to have to do together. And it's such a pleasure to see so many of you agreeing with one another and picking up where the other person left off. I'd now like to move to Minister Pompili of France for her final statement. Thank you, and thank you again for this interesting debate on the key issues. And in line with what uh, I just heard, uh, the health and economic crisis caused by the pandemic, the longer term crisis driven by global warming and this crisis we are facing uh, in Ukraine are not mutually isolated crises and must be tackled jointly. It's essential that the recovery put us on a path towards carbon neutrality by mid-century. But it is also essential that the benefits of decarbonation be equally shared and distributed. Otherwise, the goal of carbon neutrality uh, will prove politically unsustainable as it would increase inequalities. So, we need to ramp up our efforts towards a just transition for the workers and territories adversely impacted by the transition. These efforts must be part of our green recovery plan. So we have so many work to do. Thank you. We do have a lot of work to do, it's true. And it's good that all of us, that you all also recognize this. Uh, we'd like to end with our final statement from Minister Pavi Shabazov. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the renewable uh, energy source is a universal uh, source which allows um, all the countries to provide for their uh, energy supply and uh, without even having the natural, traditional hydrocarbon sources become the energy producing country and it is important for economy, it's important for environment, it's important for the energy security and of course independence. And um, uh, here I would like also to mention that this process should be, this transition uh, process uh, should be well thought out and should be very smart one and we have to go we have to uh, realize it in a way that we always go forward, not backwards. That's why we have to take care about uh, international cooperation. We have to stay together and uh, uh, provide for the better results at the end. Thank you for this excellent panel. This excellent panel is really because of the six of you that are here, and I have to say what a pleasure it has been. I know that we have a huge digital audience following us online today, and so I'd like once again to wrap up this panel by thanking my guests who are here. Minister Pavi Shabazov, the Minister of Energy for Azerbaijan. Joining us online, Minister Pompili, the Minister of the Ecological Transition for France. Minister Leonor Gavessler, the Federal Minister for Climate Action, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology for Austria, Minister Kostas Grekas, the Minister of the Environment and Energy for Greece, just to my right, Secretary Konstantin Borosan, Moldova joining us for the first time this year at the Berlin Energy Transition Dialogue, the State Secretary for Energy from Moldova, and Lucia Bakulumpaji Wamala of Bakulu Power. My thanks to all of my guests. It's been such a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to go ahead and give you a round of applause because I think we, we all deserve it. Thank you so much. <laughs>